Hi and welcome to Polly Originals with Fiona Abel Smith. Today we're going to make a cane which I've decided to call the Morris cane and it's because this is the original cane I did and once I'd made it it just reminded me so much of William Morris who started the arts and crafts movement. I remember when I was a little girl I had a piece of his material. I think it's the colours and the fact there's leaves and petals and flowers and things so I know it's not strictly like his but that's what it gave me a reminder of so that's why I've called it the Morris cane. This one was done as a result of when I do um, demonstrations for the British Polymer Clay Guild up at the National Exhibition Centre in Birmingham. We tend to make a lot of petals and a lot of um, leaf canes to show people when they're visiting the stand. And I thought it would be nice to make a kaleidoscope simply using petals and leaves, but doing them in a slightly different way. There is a rose in here, which is the orange bit, um, but I'm not going to do an exact rose today. But this little blue sp highlighted spot is a petal. And then we've got two leaf canes, this lovely dusky blue leaf and then this brighter green leaf. So effectively we've just got four elements of this cane and the colours I've chosen to do today are these ones. So this is the actual example I'm going to do and I'm also going to show you how to make it into a nice pendant. This one is done in Primo because I know a lot of you use Primo so I'll give you the colours for this at the end so you can always do this one as an alternate and that's how that one comes out. And in actual fact the colours I used aren't that dissimilar but using them in different places so leaves in this one being blue, leaves in this one being green just changes the whole look of the piece. The elements themselves are very simple and straightforward. The making of the pendant is very simple and straightforward. Um, but of course, you don't have to follow what I'm doing. You can go off piece to do whatever you want to do with this one. So let's start with the equipment we need for today's session. To complete today's project, the equipment is fairly standard for polymer clay. I'm working on a large tile. I will be using a polymer clay blade. I often refer to these as tissue blade and this is one which has got a little bit of flexibility in it because we do need to do a large curve at some stage. A craft knife, a polymer clay roller. This is quite a small one. It's about half an inch, 1.25 centimetres in diameter. I'm going to be using a couple of cable needles. Um, these are four millimetre in size, but anything roughly that size. One is to smooth the joins of our slices of polymer clay together to create a nice smooth seam and the other is to create the bale so it sits inside the bale of our piece. Cocktail stick. I also use quite often now one of the polymer clay blades. This is an old blunt blade which I never bothered to sharpen and I've just taped it up with masking tape which as you can see it's got rather dirty now but it means I'm able to use the blunt side of the blade to manoeuvre my cane slices without cutting myself on the sharp piece. Um, if you use your ordinary um, polymer clay blade there is a high likelihood that you will cut yourself so please don't do that and be careful but if you've got an old one then this works really well. For manoeuvring our slices of clay to put them together to create a veneer and also when we're doing the resin, I'm just using a small square of baking parchment. You could also use greaseproof paper, baking paper, wax, um, tracing paper, any, any of those work well. Just a small square, square so you can manoeuvre things around. You will need a little bit of cling film or um, plastic wrap when we cut through our piece. And on that you will need a cutter. This is actually a petal cutter. It's used in cake decorating and we can be bought either online or at an actual store for any stores that do cake decorating and this is just a nice sized one. Um, it's about two inches five centimeters wide um, and just gives a nice size and shape to the pendant. This one is obviously it has the same sharpness on both sides so because of that I just use a block when I'm pressing down just to save my fingers and that's just a block of MDF. Add a little sparkle I'm just using a single crystal. I've got a few here just to uh, give examples. Now this, they're called chatons and they're the ones which have got little pyramid backs. Um, it's the French word C-H-A-T-O-N and again they just they sit nicely embedded in the clay and just add a little bit of sparkle to our piece but you don't need to add those. I'll be using a tiny piece of liquid polymer clay and I've just decanted some here into a little tub to make it easy for me to get to and I'm going to put it on with a little paintbrush. And to finish my piece off, I've just got a silver chain. I will be measuring sizes as we go, both for the height of the cane and also to reduce it down. And I use this one, which is a freely downloadable sheet from www.printablepaper.net. And I've just laminated this so I can use it multiple times. 
I use a smaller tile to bake on and I will tent the whole piece in aluminium foil when I bake as in underneath and give me a nice raised area which isn't touching the polymer clay at all to prevent any burning of the clay should the oven spike in temperature whilst the clay is baking. I also use biodegradable wet wipes to clean my hands as I go along and just plain tissues just to wipe any surface that I've cleaned. I will be using a pasta machine dedicated to polymer clay use and I'll go through the details of that a little bit later. If you don't have a pasta machine then you can just stack layers of playing cards either side of your clay and then when you roll over it will eventually go down to the size of your cards and just reduce or increase the amount of cards depending on the thickness you want of your clay. I'm creating a bale on the back of the piece and to do this I'm using this little cutout and this is from a bale stencil set and this is from PC UK Tools and as you see there there's a whole variety of stencils. You can obviously just use whatever you want for a bale or to create your own shape as well but just to make life easy for myself I like this one so I use this one in the project. And now let's move on to the resin. I will be using resin in this piece. It just gives it a nice domed effect and means you can get away with having slightly thinner bit of polymer clay because the resin gives some added strength to it. This is a UV resin I'm using. So I have a little UV torch here, which I use to set the resin in place before I put it under a UV lamp. But I have then got a proper UV lamp um, because the resin I'm using today needs about 10 minutes under a proper lamp. There are loads of different resins on the marketplace. A couple of things I would say for all of them. One, whether they've got odour or no odour, they are still will give off some form of fumes. So it is best to do it in a well ventilated area. So I will always open the window. Even if it's a cold winter's day, I will open the window when I'm working with resin and I will generally just have a mask on as well. So the first one I came across that I loved was this one, which is the Deep Shine from Teresa Salgado from Tiny Pandora um, Crafting Boutique. This is wonderful. It's no odour um, and it's very easy to use. Sadly though I have run out of it because it didn't last me very long. Um, also if you're in the UK it is sadly quite expensive to ship over. If you're in the US, brilliant, so I can thoroughly recommend this one. When I was up at the NEC, as I mentioned at the show just a couple of weeks back, I did find a lovely lady called Beck Beck who was selling um, some UV resin. So I bought some from her because she said it was odourless. And oh, yes, it is. And it is fantastic. It's really, really good. Sadly, she's out of stock at the moment. Again, I will put a link to her um, website below, the same as I will to Teresa's. Um, so if you're in the UK, you can get that from her. But other than that, have a look around. Now, I have bought, it's not quite as quick for curing it's not as good as the other two but it does work quite well this is a brand that I'm using at the moment and I went for it particularly because it said it was odorless that you can just simply varnish your piece instead you can do a thicker piece and sand and polish it which will give you a lovely finish which is what I do on most of my pieces but just to show you an alternate today I thought I would do the UV resin so let's move on to the clay I'm going to use so today I'm going to show you using Fimo Soft, but all well-known brands of polymer clay will work well for this technique. And as I mentioned earlier, I will show you an alternate using the Primo Sculpey um, colours. I've put the clay in the elements that we're going to use, um, and I'll go through them. So, so for the stylized flower, I'm going for the purple and the white. Um, so that's going to be the stylized flower. For the petal, I'm using Pacific Blue and White. For the single petal that just goes in that corner, I'm using white calypso blue and the veins are going to be apple green and then for the larger leaf that I'm going to cut and make into two separate leaves we've got white apple green the veins are going to be chocolate and then the middle bit is going to be some of this purple again and then for the, some of the outlining and the little bits of background color I've gone for chocolate brown and I'm going to do a silver bale out of um, silver colored polymer clay so for the amounts these small ones are all seven grams or quarter of an ounce. Then these two are 14 grams or half an ounce. These two are 21 grams or two thirds of an ounce. And then we've got this one, which is 28 grams or one ounce. And I'll mention them in grams again as we go later into the project. I've split them up into these amounts so that you can choose whatever you want to do. So for instance, if you're going to do a petal, you might not want to do white, you might want to do blue and yellow. Just make sure you've got these combinations of amounts in whatever colour you want to do when you're creating the cane. 
The first thing to do is to get them all conditioned in these particular amounts and these colourways. And if you're unsure about conditioning polymer clay, I do have a video and I'll put a link to that which has a few tips and techniques on how to condition polymer clay quickly, particularly if you have a pasta machine to do it for you. When I condition my clay, I will put all of these through on setting number three. And on my pasta machine, three is a medium setting. And on my machine, naught is thick and nine is thin. So I will get all those conditioned and I'll bring you back when we've got that done. And we'll start with the petal cane. And we'll start with our first element, which is simply 7 grams of the white and 7 grams of the Pacific Blue. And we're going to do a very simple Skinner blend just between the two of these. And for those of you who've seen my videos before, you'll recognise what we're going to do more or less straight away, so you can almost do it by second nature now. Which is going to be very simple, effectively a petal cane. Because as I said, this design is really based on sort of leaves and flowers. So... I've done my diagonal cut and for anyone unused to Skinnaker blends I do have a tutorial which I'll put a link to in the video description below which will give you further information on how to do um, straightforward Skinner blends but for those of you who have already done it I'm sure you'll be ahead of me by now but we're just going to fold that in half I'm going to pinch the, the um, fold so that when I put it through the pasta machine it's got a, a fighting chance to go through and although I conditioned everything on setting number three because we've now got four layers I will put it up to one setting thicker so setting number two and I'll simply put it through fold first continue to fold bottom to top to get a nice blend from the white all the way through to the blue and I will do that on setting number two and bring it back when I've got to that stage when we've got the blend done I'm simply going to fold that piece in half put it back through the pasta machine dark end first with the fold at the side to get myself a longer thinner strip on that same setting number two and now I can put it back down through to get my longest thinnest strip depending on what my pasta machine is like so because I know my pasta machine is a good one I can put it straight down to my thinnest setting number nine and get myself a long thin strip if you know your pasta machine is likely to chew up or tear the polymer clay as it goes through, then go down one setting at a time until you get to your thinnest usable setting. And once we have our nice long thin strip, we're simply going to roll it up from the light end to the dark. And as I roll, I'm just making sure I've got no trapped air and keeping it as nice and tight as I can. And you never worry what it looks like on the ends, but all we're going to do is we're going to chop down into quarters. And then we're just going to pull up around the sides of each one. When we've done that, we're going to squidge it flatter. I like to do this flat on the tile, but you can do it in the air if you prefer, whichever you find easiest. And I do two at a time pushing along the bottom, put those two together, again pressing just in along the bottom, fold up the sides, push in along the bottom, put those two together and put all four pieces together, start with just pushing in along the bottom edge we want this one to be relatively thin because we're going to cut it in two in a minute. And once you've done that, then you can pull over the top to create your triangular shape. And again, I still want it to be quite thin along the bottom. Drop in half. So you see the design. Put those two halves together. And again, I'm just going to press in just along the bottom just to make them slightly longer. And then pull along the top. And this is going to be our first petal. So we want it to be more petal shaped. So I'm just going to push in down the sides and then with my thumbs and fingers creating a diamond shape in the middle and with the lines going across I'm just going to create more of a petal shape and I want this to be about two inches in height or about five centimeters and say so roughly petal shape but importantly when we're doing a kaleidoscope if you can try and keep the size the same from one end to the other I'll just double check how I do on size. That's about fine. So that is our first element done. So that can be put to one side. And we'll start on our second element. 
So for our second element, we're going to have seven grams of the purple and seven grams of the white. And in Fimo, this purple really is quite a deep pink as far as I'm concerned, uh, much more than a, what I would call a distinct purple colour. Um, so if you're wanting to do something similar in one of the other colours, go for more of um, a sort of fuchsia type colour um, rather than a, a deep dark purple. We're going to do exactly the same with these two as we did with the blue just now. So creating our Skinner blend, so diagonal cut down both pieces, layer the two pieces together, put them back and I'll do exactly the same all the way through until we get that nice long thin strip and I'll bring you back when I've got to that stage. So there we go and this time rather than rolling it we're just going to concertina it and I'm doing it probably about three quarters of an inch about two centimeters just under two centimeters in width and then we're just going backwards and forwards trying to make sure we don't have too many air pockets caught in those folds. You can be more precise than me if you want to but obviously because I'm doing a video I try to do it relatively quickly for you. Don't worry if it's misshapen, as you see mine always are, but I will then just even it out by sort of pressing down on the tile and we're looking for a little rectangular block of clay. Once we've got that, we actually want to cover this in a layer of our outside or dark colour. So I'm going to take that huge piece of brown, just chop off a slice and then I'm going to put this through a thin setting, so setting number seven on my pasta machine, because I just want a, a very thin layer to go around the outside of that piece. There we go. I'm going to use my blade to give myself roughly the right height. Neaten off one end, and then that just wraps all the way around. If you do find a tiny bit like that pulls off, you can always just patch a bit in. It's really not a problem with polymer clay. And now I'm going to press down and reduce this by pressing in along the length with my fingers. Until we get to about four inches in length. When you're more or less there, just chop into four equal pieces. And then keeping the darker side up, I'm just going to press it flat with my thumb down onto the work surface, but mainly down on one side only. So what we're going to end up with is a long thin piece down here and more of a, an upward piece here. So just press it down. And then with your roller, really roll that bottom end away till it's nice and thin. So you can either do it on your tile or if you find that it's problems picking it up or you lose bits you can of course do it on your laminated sheet and it'll peel off more easily from that. And just work your way through doing the same with all four. And taking one piece, decide whether you want the light on the inside or the dark on the um, inside. I'm going to put the light towards me and then just twist up. This just makes a very sort of stylized flower. It sort of looks very roughly rose-like. If you added more petals around the outside, you probably could go rose. Um, and then just keep adding the pieces, overlapping the previous piece as you go around, starting with the thin piece and working out towards the large piece. When you've got the pieces all together, just press them in slightly more to give you a more rounded shape. Give a slight roll. And again, we want about two inches in height, so I'll just chop off the end. You don't need to chop the end off. I'm just chopping it off so you can see roughly the pattern that we've got there. So those are two of our elements done. So that's the petal and the stylized flower. So now we can move on to the leaf elements. 
So the next element is the single large leaf. So for that we're going to go 14 grams of the Calypso blue, 14 grams of the white and 7 grams of the apple green. So the apple green goes on one side for now because that's going to be the veins in a moment. And we're going to do exactly the same as we did before. It's just a two-way Skinner blend. Put your blend together, get the nice blend across, get it into a thin strip and then get it down to your thinnest possible strip using your pasta machine. And once we've got to that stage, we're going to concertina it backwards and forwards. And again, going to concertina it about probably just over three quarters of an inch, sort of two, just over two centimetres wide. Um, and I'll bring you back when we're at that stage. So there we are, there's our rough sort of oblong, and I say rough because I haven't eaten it, because I want to create more of a leaf shape with this one. So again, I'm going to use that diamond shaping with my thumb and fingers just to push. So I've got the white at one end and the blue at the other. The other thing is, for me, that's a bit high. I actually want it to, it's only about that height, which is probably just over an inch. So all I'm going to do with the heel of my hand is I'm just going to press it flatter, top and bottom, and then take a bit of time just making sure that the shape of it in particular is more even. I'm not too worried about the fact it's going to go like that in the middle. If you can keep it so it's perfect, that's wonderful. Um, but when you're putting your pieces together, you're not going to have pieces next to each other so um, different with that that it's going to look weird in the kaleidoscope. So the shape is sort of important because we're about to put some lines in this. So if you can keep it fairly neat going down, that's fine. But Honestly, don't worry about that sort of thing. It all comes out in the wash when we make it down into a smaller piece. So I've got, as you can see, a very sort of rough leaf shape. And all I'm going to do is with my craft knife, I'm going to mark out the middle stem. And then I'm going to mark out three veins on one side. And then in a different place, three veins on the other side. Now, everyone does their leaves differently, so you can do them however you want to do yours. But this is how I do my leaves. Um, and I mark on top so I can see where I'm going. I will then fold my colour that I want my leaf vein to be, so it's the same height roughly as my piece. And we only want thin veins, so I'm going to put this through on setting number seven that way down so I get a longer, thinner strip, roughly the white right height for what I want for the veins. And now using our lines as a guide, all we're going to do is cut and inset the lines to create our leaf. So I do half at a time, so first thing to do is to chop down, and because we've got those nice sort of pointed ends you can generally cut down fairly evenly and then just use the lines as a guide so I'm just going to chop down here and then working on the top part take your vein color cut yourself a line and start just inside that top edge because the veins don't always go right to the end on a leaf so chop off the excess and put your pieces back together. Turn back to your cut side and then repeat for the next two and then on this side repeat for all three. So I'll probably speed up slightly so you don't have to sit and watch it in slow motion but you get the idea. I always work on the top part because it's easier to see where to cut off and one side at a time. And then when you've got your two sides done, we're just going to put them together with again a piece not quite at the very top, but going down towards the bottom. And then you can put your two sides together. And that is our leaf. And then I'm just going to take all the excess bits of the green Make 
sure there's no air trapped inside. Roll it to a size that's the right height to go around my piece. Then press one end thinner and I'll put it through the pasta machine and I'll start on setting number six. And what I'm looking for is to get a piece that's long enough to go all the way around. I don't think it'll be number six, it's probably going to be more like something like number eight, but we'll give it a try to start with. So no, that's not enough, so I'll try setting number eight. There we go. So I know from experience, having done this, that seven, setting seven doesn't quite go through. And each time I've done it, setting eight has worked. But on yours, obviously then go six to seven to eight and use the thickest setting you can get to give yourself a layer to go all the way around. And then that just goes at the bottom and that folds nicely all the way around the outside of your leaf. Drop off the excess. And those bits can go on one side because we can use those as an infill when we go around the outside of our cane. So now we have three pieces ready to go. Our last element is the biggest one. So we've got 21 grams of white, 21 grams of apple green, just seven grams of the purple, which again, this is one that looks sort of a dark pink to me. And I've also taken um, the large amount of brown I've got left, because we're going to do some of the veins in brown and then the middle vein we're going to do in the pink for this particular leaf. So putting those two to one side for a moment, we're going to do exactly the same as we've done before, the Skinner blend. So cut those two pieces in half, twist them round, put them together, and we are going to do exactly the same as we did with this leaf, all the way up to getting it um, into that shape, cutting, marking out the veins, and putting the side veins in, and the side veins in this one are going to be the brown, so I put that down onto a setting number seven to get those thin veins, and then the middle vein is the only way that this one is going to be different, although of course this one is also going to be slightly larger. So I'll get down to the stage where I'm starting to put those veins in, I'll probably fast forward through the veins for you, and then we'll come back where we're at the stage to put the middle piece in. We now want to put the centre vein in, so I've just got my piece of purple, it's still on that setting number three. If you can, do it on a thicker setting, so I'll just put that so it's folded that way, and just try it on setting number two, because it's nice to have a nice big colour difference, so we can just about get away with that, so I'll put that through. If you've got a very chunky bit at the top, just push that down so it goes to a nice tapered end, and there is our nice coloured vein in. just gives an extra zing in the design when you do that. And I've now, having sort of got my brown back up into a nice roll, I've just taken a piece that's the right height. And again, as we did before with the other leaf, I want a nice thin outer layer, but I'm just going to give myself a head start by getting it the right height. Roll it so the pasta machine doesn't have to work quite so hard. I don't want to put a big thick piece in. A small piece is fine, but not a big thick piece. Get it to roughly the right height. Tape it in through first and we'll put that through on setting number seven just to wrap around the whole of the outside of the leaf. As always with a kaleidoscope, you can put them together any way you want and as long as you do the cut through thing, which we're going to do with this leaf, you'll have a similar looking pattern and have that nice flow of movement around the pattern. You don't have to do the same as I'm doing at all. You can just make it up. And if yours looks slightly different, that's absolutely fine. Every time I've done this, I think I've done it very slightly differently. You've already seen how some of the patterns come out. And I'll show you um, something else at the end as well, where I did a slightly smaller leaf and that gave a different pattern. The large leaf is actually going to be two leaves. So that's the first thing we're going to do is put these pieces just to one side for a second. And in this diamond shape, we're just going to push it more into a diamond shape 
because it's just easier to reduce it and all I'm doing is I'm just pushing along the sides and we want this we want this to be two thirds and one third so when it's got to a length that you're happy with you can cut it into that sort of size I will get to about three inches um, seven and a half centimeters and cut it into that size I'm keeping it sort of diamond shape you don't have to you can make it square if you'd rather if it's easier to reduce in that way and sometimes you can just pull it longer whilst also pushing in You've got it sort of roughly that size. Chop one third off. And then the larger piece, the two thirds piece, put that to one side because that's the piece that's going to cut across our design. And now we can start putting our piece together. I'm going to work so it's about um, one and a half or two inches in height because I, I like that sort of length because it makes it easier to reduce um, once we've got all the pattern together but it's not so high that you can't be consistent from one end from top to bottom so the first thing we're going to do is with our dark blue leaf we're just going to change this so I want to put a nice curve in this so it doesn't matter which way you do it but effectively I'm going to make a sort of point on the sides this is going to be curving around one part of our triangular cane. As you can see by doing that it is becoming slightly taller. So we're just getting a nice curve on it. I'm going to take my brown which I've rolled into a log. I'm just going to insert a little bit of brown in the back there, so probably about a third of what's left. And I'm just going to push that down on the tile and then flatten out across the top. Because when you push down with your fingers, you create a triangle. And then, of course, when you flatten along the top, you create a little sort of semicircle shape. And I'm just going to widen that out slightly because I don't want much. Just want a little something. And it's something that we can cut through when we put the insert through the middle. So I'm just going to sit that in there, chop off the excess. So now I'm going to take our smaller piece of that second leaf and I'm going to flatten down this top to make it more of a triangular piece. And all I'm doing is I'm just rocking it on the tile. And then once it's got slightly flat, with my fingers, I'm just changing the shape. And because this bit's slightly narrower, I'm just pulling him down. And we're going to end up with a triangular piece. Now it needs to be the same height to match him with our previous piece. And that's going to go sort of down here and around. So I'm going to put a bit of a curl in this one as well. And I'm going to curl the white end around so he sort of half sits in there and half sits on the inside. And again, it's completely up to you how you do yours. You don't have to do exactly the same as me. So our blue piece needs to go a little bit shorter. He's going to sit sort of in there going in towards the angle which then leaves a little triangular gap here. So again, we'll take another bit of our brown. And as we did before, we're going to create a triangular pattern or shape just by pressing down with our fingers. We don't want a particularly big one. So I'm just pulling it longer. I'm just going backwards and forwards to create that triangular shape. And then he can just slot in there. And I will take off the excess, top and bottom. Obviously keep your fingers well out of the way of the sharp blade. And then our last piece, this sort of stylized cane, is going to sit 
going inwards. And as you can see, there's a little sort of pointed gap here. So I'm just going to point one side. And again, he's taller. So we're going to press him down till he fits in. And he will just fit in there. So there we're going to squidge in there. And our last little thing, can you see we've got a little triangle here as well. Now it's only a very thin one. So you might be able to do it just with these little off-cut pieces. Or of course I've still got this bit left as well. And that should be just enough to fit in there. And I will take the excess off again. And the one little asked area, we've got a little bit of a gap in here. So I'm going to reinforce that by actually putting more of a gap in there and forcing that down because that then forces the clay towards there. And just because we've got purple on this side and nothing on this side, I will add that little bit in there. So that is our pattern done for our cane. However, of course, we still have this bit left. And this is going to be a lovely cut through that cuts effectively right across the middle of this piece and creates that top swell. And to do this, we're just going to press this into a nice long thin leaf that I want to go effectively from one side almost touching through to the other. So to start with, obviously, we're nice and tall so we can push him down a bit. And just with my fingers, I am going to push him top and bottom to get him nice and thin. And it doesn't matter if the leaf pattern itself becomes distorted. That's absolutely fine because we're not looking for a leaf particularly. We're just looking for something to cut through. I also find it normally does go a little bit taller than the cane I'm working on. And that, again, that's fine. We don't have to use all of this. It'd be great to use in another project as well. But just get it so you've got a nice curve on it. That's, yes, that's the right sort of uh, size. Carefully curve your blade. Decide where you want your piece to go. And I want it to come right through this blue and then right through that blue, roof, blue leaf to cut right through the design but with a nice curve on. So with your blade flexed, gently seesaw down because that tends to keep the blade in roughly the same shape. And once your piece is cut through, you can insert. So I don't want it to go touching right down to that far edge, so I'm going to leave it just inside our blue. It's obviously too long, that's fine, so I'm just going to chop that off for now. I say that piece will work in another project completely. I say put it back so it wasn't quite touching. Put the blue pieces back together. And put that piece in. And just look top and bottom to make sure that you're matching up as best you can where those bits would go. And the fact that this bit's sticking out at the end is absolutely fine because we will simply curve him round. And again, that just adds into the design and the pattern. And our cane is now ready to reduce. And by reducing it, all I'm going to do is I'm going to force more of a point into our pieces where the point is. And then once I've got those done, I can start working my way down and I'm just pressing in with my fingers, rotating each time and forcing the whole piece into more of a triangular shape. And I will keep this up, pushing in whilst pulling out till I have a nice long cane and we can then cut through the middle and see what pattern we have got. So I think we're at a small enough size that I can easily reduce the two halves if I chop it in half and show you the pattern that we have. And that is how this one is going to kaleidoscope. So I'm just going to reduce one part down now to the right size and I know from experience having used this cutter before that I need mine to be just over the one inch size so just fractionally over so I'll get this one done 
down to that size and then I can take off six thick pieces um, and I'll bring you back when I've got to that. Okay, so when you've got it down to the size you want it, I'm just going to take off a slice at the end, make sure my end's nice and neat. As you can have a look, see there that it's roughly um, an equilateral triangle, so you know it's roughly the right um, shape. Obviously good practice is to leave it to rest um, a good sort of 20 minutes or so, so that when you slice down you get less distortion. So if you are someone who gets quite a bit of distortion when you slice, I do recommend um, waiting 20 minutes. But you know me by now, I'm not the most patient person, and because I'm doing a video, I'm going to do it straight away. Um, now we do want quite thick slices, um, so I'm going to take a couple of slices, but to be honest, I'm then going to do it off camera because I look right over the top when I'm taking my slices, and of course the back of my head is not the best view um, when I'm doing a video. But I'm looking for a slice it's quite chunky today so I'm going so it's probably sort of a good sort of four millimeters um, probably about a quarter of an inch because I'm working on the basis we're not going to put anything on the other side so we're going to have, have a patterned front and back so you want six slices exactly the same and to say I will do that off camera and I will come back when I've got those all cut and I'll show you what we're going to do with them next so I've got my six slices cut and at this point I need to put them together in a hexagon and I've still got quite a bit of that one left and I've already taken more slices off that one which I'll tell you about in just a second. But the thing to do now is to decide which way you want to put your slices together because of course you're going to have three different patterns depending on how you put them together. So what I've found in the past is that the initial way I put them together isn't always the pattern that I like best. So what I've done is I've taken 24 slices and made a little kaleidoscope pattern so you can see how the whole pattern comes out when it's put together like that. And if you wanted to do something like this, then I've got quite a few videos where I show you the techniques I use um, for putting these together in a veneer like this. And I show you how to do that in both the bowl tutorial, the hexagon coasters, and a couple of others, and I'll put links to those in the details below. But having done that, I can now quite clearly see the choices. So I can have the pink in the middle, the green in the middle, or this dusky color in the middle. So what I would then do is to hold the design over it to see which way I prefer the pattern to go on the finished piece. And for this one, I'm actually going to go with that one in the middle. So now I know that, I can go back to my pieces. And I now know that I can put them together with that dusky blue in the middle. I find it easier to put three pieces together, put them down and with my covered blade press flat and then I'll need to do the reverse so that piece is going to be like that. So that piece will go like that and that piece will go there. If I do the same with this one, make sure they're nice and flat, then I should be able to turn that round and put all the pieces together. And there we have our hexagon pattern. And it's going to be, for me at the moment, just slightly less than I want, because if I cut through that, I'd have a bit missing on either side. But I know by the time I roll all these pieces together and extend it wider it'll be a perfect size for what I'm doing and by making it slightly smaller I'm not going to miss any of the pattern um, whereas if I'd made the pieces bigger and then cut through them I would miss some of that blue on the outside so with my cable needle all I'm going to do is very gently and not with the point but with this bit just inside the point just persuade those slices together work in towards the middle and just gently go around all six of the joins. If when you've rolled up towards the middle, you get a little bit of a lump, I don't know if you can see that just in the middle, then you can very carefully, with your blade curved, just take that off to give you a nice neat finish in the middle 
and then I'm going to, with my roller, just very gently make sure the roller's nice and clean, roll from side to side, make sure that's nice and flat. And that automatically makes it slightly long, slightly wider. And then I want to make sure the underneath is good too. So I'm just going to gently peel it off. I'm not going to worry if it becomes slightly parted, because I'm now going to do exactly the same on the underneath. And then exactly the same as before, peel that off and put it back down so we're on the right side. And if there are any bits that have slightly come apart, I will go over them. Now the reason I peeled it off, rather than get the tissue blade and sliding it underneath, is that it's amazing how often when you slide it underneath, you just catch little bits of clay on the blade and by sliding it you get those little bits stuck to the underneath. Whereas peeling it off our sheet, and this is why I work on one of these sheets, means you shouldn't get any more blemishes on the surface. And then I can position and that's actually more or less the perfect size. Particularly when we add the little bit of cling film so I can get all the pattern in right up to the edges. If I needed to, if it was still a little bit um, thin, I could just roll slightly wider on those two sides. And you just look over the top, get a little bit of cling film, press that nicely on top and find exactly where your midpoint is. So again, I'm just gonna pull that towards me slightly because I like to do it with my head right over the top. Once I'm roughly in place, I will gently push it just with my fingers and then with the board, because this is a double-sided um, cutter where both sides are sharp, I will just press down with the boards to make sure I don't hurt my fingers. Okay, so I've pressed down. Press completely down, pull the cling film away. And because the cling film with the cutters tend to leave a tiny little residue, I'm just with my craft knife going all the way around the edge. So that when I peel him off, that little excess residue stays in place and I've got a nice neat piece. So our piece is nearly ready to go. All we want to do is to give a little um, bail on the top of it and for this, I've got that silver clay, so the last piece of clay we haven't used yet. Um, and I thought the silver would look nice, obviously the gold, whatever colour you've got. And I'm just going to take our little piece from the PC UK Tools bale set and just simply cut around it. it off your shape and then with something like the cable needle I'm just going to pull that over to create our bail. I'm just going to go back in just to refine the shape slightly. Now I just like to do a little bit of patterning on the underneath just to give a little bit of extra definition. I'm going to find the tile we're going to bake on, take our little bale, and I'm going to get a little bit of liquid clay just on the end of my paintbrush and add it just on the top of the bale there. And for what we're doing today, you could use um, PVA glue instead if you'd rather. Take off any excess, I don't want too much. And then you can just slip your piece over the top of the bale. Gently pull the needle out and then I'll just neaten off by pressing it in to give a nice shape. And then for this bit I will usually just put that in back slightly because you don't have to do this but I like to add just a little bit of sparkle at the top where that joins. So I add one of these chatons and again they're available from lots of jewellery stores, where your bead stores rather. And you just choose your colour. So they're so the little ones which got the triangular back. So because I put a little bit of liquid clay in there and I've made the hole with a cocktail stick. So he just sits in there. 
and with the liquid clay that shouldn't need to be glued afterwards. If when you finish baking it does pop out, just put a little bit of something like um, super glue or the two-part epoxy resin in and it will bake. And see there, there's the bale with a piece. And then as per normal, tent the whole tile in aluminium foil to protect it should the oven spike during baking and bake according to the manufacturer's instructions for the brand of clay you are using. And we'll come back to put the finishing touches onto this piece. Once your piece is out of the oven and cooled, it's completely up to you as to what you do with it. You could leave it exactly like that, just put a chain or a piece of cord or something through it and have it as a nice pendant, although it's relatively thin so you have to be a bit careful. Or you could varnish it, front and back. What I'm planning to do is to put a little bit of resin on it. If you use the two-part resin, which dries over a sort of 24 hours, there's nothing to hold it in. So the best thing to use for this is the UV resin. And for that, I've got a little UV torch. So I will put the resin on top. I will then cure it quickly with the resin torch just to hold the um, resin all in place and then put it under a resin lamp to cure. And in this case, I'll do it for about 10 minutes um, just to make sure it's nice and hard. And that'll give us a nice domed effect. I normally like to use a smaller bottle. But seeing as I haven't got any smaller bottles at the moment, I've only got this large one, we will do it with this. And I'm going to put a fair amount on in the middle area, and then with one of these stirry sticks, I'll just push it towards the side. And having it um, on the piece of paper here means I can move it around easily. And also this bit I'm not going to cover in resin, so it gives me a chance to hold it on that piece as I go as well. I want to avoid bubbles if I can, so I'll just pop that as it comes out with the nozzle. And then I'm just simply, gently, gently going to squeeze on some resin right in the middle. I want a fairly thick, sort of domed part over this bit, so I can add a fair bit on. Once you've got to the stage where you've got enough, put the lid back on your resin straight away. And of course you should be doing this, as I mentioned earlier, in a well ventilated room. So I've got the window open at the moment. Um, I offer often if I'm doing quite a few pieces we'll also put a mask on and I'm just brushing it up towards a little bit of the sparkly shut on in the middle and then down towards the edge but not over the edge because I don't want it to pull over although if it does you can just wipe it off and when I've got it where I want it to do I wipe the end of the stick and very quickly just put the UV torch over it and that just really holds it in place. So I'm only going to do this probably for about sort of 30 to 40 seconds, just enough so that it's not going to move um, and the top bit of the resin is cured. And now I can pick it up and go and put it in the UV lamp. So here's our final finished pendant with that nice resin layer on top. And that's given it a lot of stability now and a nice bit of um, thickness. So it'll be nice as a pendant. And I've just added a chain to the top there. So here's an alternate colour option. And this one I used Primo Sculpey Clay because I know a lot of you use Primo. So here's an option with some Primo colours for you. So for the background, it may look brown, but that's actually three parts of alizarin crimson to one part of the antique gold and that gives that nice sort of um, deep red colour in the back. For the stylized flower you've got a mixture of wasabi and white and it's interesting how although it is green and it's that lovely deep green it sort of comes out very gold because you've got that little bit of the um, crimson around the outside and the white as well but that is actually wasabi and white in there. For the petal, the one in the middle here, I've used turquoise and white for the single leaf, the one that bends round in the corner, we've got wisteria and white with turquoise veining down the middle. And then I've used a little bit of the extra wasabi as the inset. Remember we put a little inset on the outside of the cane as we did that. And then for the larger leaf that goes both for the inside bit and the bit that curls through the whole bit, we've got cobalt blue and white with crimson vein and then some of the wasabi straight down the middle. And the bale... I've just used some of the antique gold and obviously a little bit of a blue crystal in that one. So that's how that comes out. And then to have another alternate colour scheme, this one's got quite an autumnal feel to it. This particular scheme I was experimenting again. So this one, as I mentioned earlier, has got the slightly smaller, 
you know, the curved inset leaf. So rather than doing that one a larger leaf as I did in the finished piece, this leaf, which I put into two parts, was the same size as the single leaf we did. So you see that just a slightly more sort of delicate feel. So if you'd rather have that, then don't do this leaf when we cut into two quite as big. So for this one, I also, with the stylized flower, it came out quite squished because I pushed it a long way into the cane. But just for colour-wise, that is brilliant blue and white with chocolate round the outside. And again, I've got the chocolate brown in the back of this one again. The petal cane was actually the green, so that was the tropical green and white. The large single leaf was ruby red and white with tropical green as the veins. And for the leaf that I put into two parts, so this one, we've got tangerine and white with brilliant blue. And rather than adding a separate colour in the middle vein as we did in the tutorial, that's just got the brilliant blue down the middle of the vein as well. And again, that's how this one came out. Just did it on a silver bezel with this one and with the resin top. And that came out quite nicely, so that's a nice alternate colour scheme for you. And finally, just to show you the one that started it all off, the colours on this weren't direct colours from the packet, which is why I had to go slightly alternate to do the tutorial. But you can see that it was a very sort of dusky, deep blue that was the start of this middle leaf, um, which is what gave it that lovely colour. And then I went sort of um, orangey, and this was an actual rose cane that I did, which was the original one, but I've just done, as I say, that stylized form. And again, the other bits, the blue petals I've kept very much for the tutorial, the green leaf I have, but in the middle of that green leaf, there is a bit of um, pinky purple which again went round the outside and the veins in that one were pink um, but again that's that's the one that set it off that's one that gave me this William Morris feel which is why I've called this one the Morris cane and whilst I like that it was almost impossible to replicate that in a tutorial because I was just using leftover bits of colour and it meant too much colour mixing but have an experiment and see what colours you come up with and as a cane I think it just gives a really nice effect and feel and there we go, there's our finished pieces, and that is the Morris Cane Pendant in a polymer clay. I hope you enjoyed that one. As always, thank you so much for watching, and a special thank you to those of you who subscribe, I really do appreciate it. I think that's it for now, hopefully I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>